morning again, everyone, both here in the room and online. Um, it's my panel to try to moderate this wonderful panel discussion we're going to have. Um, what I'd like to do first is eat, is ask um, our panelists, and I want to say we have two in the room and we have two online, and I would like them all to introduce themselves and um, tell us a little about, just a little about who they are and their affiliation. So I'll start here um, um, with Jill, and we'll go then on to Laurel, and then we'll go to our two panelists online. Thank okay. you. Well, thank you, and thank you for the invitation. Hi, I'm Jill Hines. I'm Senior Director of Nationwide Health Systems Improvement and Indoor Air Quality at the American Lung Association. And I just wanted to briefly comment that I was asked to comment about how the American Lung Association incorporates chemicals into our mission. And we do at all three levels of research, advocacy, and education. Specifically within the education arm, we do look at chemicals in homes, childcare schools, and also at work. And yesterday on my travel from Minneapolis into DC, I read the um, report that we're discussing today in its entirety. And <laughs> one of the things that- it Sounds like a long plane ride. <laughs> <laughs> it was. Um, one thing became clear to me is that indoor chemistry is very complex. We know a lot and there's a lot yet we do not know. And what we do need is a trusted champion like the American Lung Association and others who can take the information of the research, the surveillance and the data, and then be a conduit to translate that information as trustworthy information and to reach our target audiences. And so to Dr. Vito, you spoke exactly to one of my points is you need that third party. And I think the Lung Association is in a position to do that. So thank you for inviting me today. Oh, Laura. Thank you. Here. Thank you very much. Um, uh, it's it's really an honor. Um, when I met Linda this morning, I told her I feel like I've known her for a really long time because she's definitely someone um, as an environmental scientist that I've looked up to and listened to her many, many webinars. And so it's an honor to be participating in this panel with her moderating. My name is Laurel Royer, and I lead a small environmental um, research consulting firm that I started last year. And in part, it had to do with sort of like my observations going from graduate school into consulting um, and identifying these gaps of how we translate and move um, research from academic institutions, um, from non-governmental organizations um, and federal government to actually reach communities how we translate that work, how we communicate it. A lot of those tasks are complex. Chemistry is complex. Environmental science is complex. And of course, this indoor chemistry conversation we're having today is indeed complex. And a lot of our work has focused on out, out, outside chemistry. Um, there hasn't been that mesh with how critical the outdoor exposures have influenced indoor exposures, um, particularly for the vulnerable populations, um, the communities that exist within the frameworks of environmental justice communities, um, and how we move through um, ensuring that conversations are very specific and considerate of communities. Um, and I hope that with this panel, we can address how communications um, about chemistry exposures in particular cannot be broadly applied. And while um, Dr. Vito, you mentioned that we can't reach everybody, however, ensuring that the vulnerable populations aren't also in that group of folks that we don't reach and then therefore are further excluded um, in the messaging. And I hope that's what I can share today in filling those gaps. Thank you. 
had the mic. All right. <laughs> you think I'd learn. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, we'll turn to our online participants and we'll start with Beth Hare. Hi, everyone, and um, thank you for allowing me to be virtual today. It was not what my actually my intent today. Anyway, I am Beth Hare. I am a senior vice president at um, the Truth Initiative. We are the largest um, non-governmental um, tobacco control um, messaging um, group, and we've been around for 25 years. Um, I am a senior vice president in the Schroeder Institute, which is our research department, and being that we are tobacco control, indoor and outdoor air quality are kind of a key um, component of our messaging strategy, and we've messaged on it over the years. And I'm going to say one of the things I find that really works well with a public health um, messaging strategy is having kind of all legs of the stool, all the stakeholders there. So, so having a strong public education campaign that that does, as I think Laurel was was mentioning try to reach as, as our vulnerable populations and our general um, population, but also having policies in place. And one of the nice things about being remote is I've been able to, to kind of monitor the, the chat I'm going on and kind of seeing people say, hey, we need more policies too. And I think the most effective, um, what we've learned in tobacco mm -hmm. control, the most effective way to affect change is having public education tied with on the ground grassroots supports and policy interventions, all working simultaneously together. Thank you, Beth. That was very helpful. Thank you, <laughs> Beth. Very helpful and a good introduction to some of the questions, I think, or answers you may bring to the panel. And then our fourth member of the panel, uh, Laura Cole, who is also online. Laura? Good morning, everyone. This is Laura Cobb. I recently retired from EPA working in the field of indoor air quality. And my goal was and continues to be reducing exposure of the public to indoor air pollutants and protecting public health. And I think that indoor air quality is a under-recognized issue. It's one of the major public health challenges of, of our time. And indoor chemistry is really a large component of that that many people are not very familiar with. And so I'm looking forward to our additional discussion today. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I think you now, um, those in the room and online have a good idea of the expertise that we have on this panel. And I'd kind of um, like to start with a question uh, that I'm gonna to direct to Laurel. Uh, so, Laura, how are government officials and public health professionals engaging with data related to indoor air quality and exposures? That's a, a great question. Um, I think um, it's, it's complex, um, but perhaps we can start off with uh, maybe not enough. Um, how... A lot of funding today, I think, focuses on collection of data. Um, we're collecting a lot of data. We need to monitor more. Um, we need to go into communities. We need to get this data, more data, more data, more data. However, I would say over the last 20, 30 years, we've collected a significant amount of environmental data, environmental exposure data. However, a lot of that information remains in many silos and aren't being utilized or mined to influence and inform how perhaps new data is collected. Um, further, uh, public health officials, I think, aren't as involved in many uh, spaces perhaps that they should be. For example, um, I live in the Atlanta area and we're going back to the conversation of outdoor air quality and indoor air quality. On the west side of Atlanta was recently identified as, um, I think it's now you know, categorized as a super fun site. Um, there are over, and this is in a residential community, um, over 2000 homes were identified of which 
uh, I think several hundred were already sampled. The issue at that location is lead. We understand how um, critical lead exposure is, particularly to children. <clears throat> Within that community, the focus is a review of 400 parts per million in order to clean up a site. In January, the EPA re, um, reduced the two, reduced 400 to 200 parts per million threshold. And in areas of multiple sources, that gets driven down to 100. The site is being cleaned, those communities are being cleaned at 400 parts per million. The EPA's guidance, if you look at the Superfund page related to the west side of Atlanta, the driver around dust, so they're gonna remove soil, right? It's being disturbed. You're gonna re remove soil. A lot of these homes in that area are older. Um, there are a number of schools, elementary schools in the area. And the, the reassurance for the community is we have monitors for a particular threshold. If we reach half of that, then we're gonna wet the soil. This is an opportunity where I think pub more public health, more engagement with the community and true communication around cleaning the outside of the homes, cleaning around windows, ensuring the windows are closed, the exposure for kids, and what this redisturbance of the soil actually means for people who continue to live. Because again, this is a residential community. This excavation is occurring while people are in place in those homes. So this is an example where we have data that tells us how challenging lead is, right? We have data that tells us the impact of lead on children, et cetera, but there's actually no communication to the community mm -hmm. about how they protect themselves in their homes while this is happening outside. There isn't any communication around how do we clean as we go um, for those communities living in, in the communities, um, for the folks living in the community. So that's just like one real tangible example. Um, there are others in, and I'm making this very relevant to vulnerable communities. I know there are others and my colleagues will likely share some of those. Um, the EPA recently issued, um, the White House recently uh, presented their initiatives around reducing emissions around chloroprene, um, ethylene oxide. These are chemicals we haven't even heard in this room about the quality of indoor air. Um, what does that mean for folks living in the footprint where those, those um, chemicals are emitted, meaning industrial facilities, and I'm, I'm bringing your attention to Louisiana within the footprint of, of petrochemical manufacturing. How, how do we educate those communities, right? It's very widely accepted that we spend 90% of our time indoors. And so while I truly believe chemistry is life, however, for many, many people, chemistry is also death, right? And so how do we use the data that already exists around the, the monitoring around facilities, um, the, the reporting, you know, whether it's self-reporting or others to the EPA to better inform communities. Again, we talked about who we engage and, and we'll bring that up a little bit later um, to better educate folks and not always put it on the individual to drive their own safety when where they live is really not a consequence of their own actions. Was, wasn't I on? I thought I was. It was red. <laughs> okay, does anyone else on the panel want to jump in uh, to this question? I mean, I think what I'm hearing is, again, the issues of communication becoming almost paramount. Um, never mind the issues of some of the understandings being siloed, so how do you develop the messages? Um, Jill? I was actually thinking of a couple of examples about analysis and synthesis of examples. So I'll be very brief, but provide two different examples. Um, 
one of the areas that I think that we need to uh, think about is the interaction or the chemical transformation between um, therapeutic chemicals and then harmful chemicals. And so let me go into that a little deeper. One of the things I was thinking about when I was reading the report was that chemical transformation. In respiratory health, we have a number of medications for asthma, COPD, or other respiratory diseases. The, the large majority of those are inhaled medications, they're particulate medications, and they're topical. So where they land is where they do the benefit. What we don't know, or if we do, I don't know, the research of the chemical interaction between those therapeutic medications, those therapeutic chemicals, and then the indoor, indoor air uh, chemicals that we might be exposed to. And is there an interaction and does it um, affect the effect, um, impact the effect efficacy of those th therapeutic chemicals. And so I think that's an area of, or a gap in future research. The other example I was thinking about around analysis or th synthesis for public health messages is around clean rooms. We know um, the American Lung Association, Association, EPA, and others have promote, been promoting the development and sustaining a clean room in wildfire and wildland smoke exposure with the idea of reducing that particulate matter through the use of something like an air cleaner for those individuals with existing lung disease. But when it, So we've really been focusing on reducing that particulate matter from that wild land or wildfire smoke, but we haven't thought about in that clean room, do we have additional chemicals? And it occurs to me that that is something that we need to also address in our public health messages, or it's an opportunity to address when we talk about developing those clean rooms. Well, I see that we're beginning to get into lots of different areas, which kind of gets to be fun. But I'm wondering, um, Beth, if you would have a comment on developing some of the messages. Yeah, and I think that um, I love everything that Jill and and Laurel have been saying. I think that one of the things that kind of that we've learned from producing public health messages over the years is for like there needs to be that deep dive, not not only into what the science is saying, but then there's the the pairing. It's like what actually is is not known. Right. And I think Laurel, you were getting to some of that in your comments. It's like, what's not what's not known by our community that we're trying to reach? And then you've got to pair that in a really systematic way of saying, how do we get the the key information that's not known in those communities with what the science is saying about the the work? And I think, you know, Jill, you you are really doing a great job of talking about like where we do still have real gaps in the research, but I think that there's it, there's even areas where we do know we've, we're on really solid grounds that we know that are just not known in the communities. And we've got to figure out how to pull that, that science in and make it into a very kind of clear and accessible language for, for our communities um, that are most at risk with indoor air quality. Oh, it's, I guess I have to take my finger off. Just a tap, it's on now. Okay. Um, I was thanking the, the comments we've already had, but I want to try to move to the question about, you know, communication, I think is absolutely key here and, and the appropriateness and the necessity for different messaging to different communities. Um, not that the science changes, but that how you communicate that um, may change and how you develop those messages may change. But Alora, could you address the issue about how do you make uh, a message actionable? It's one thing to tell people the sky is falling. It's another thing to tell them how to prevent that from happening. Laura? Hi, everyone. Yes, yeah, so, you know, it, it, EPA, we really strove for a balance between 
identifying the issues with the biggest bang for the buck where we really get um, a public health benefit and finding out and addressing what people want to know and doing it in plain language, right? You don't want to frighten people. There's no point telling them there's all these scary things and you can't do anything about it. So it has to be very practical and accessible. You can't tell everyone to buy a $2,000 air cleaner, right? But you could say things like damp wipe instead of spraying things to reduce your exposure. Use a range hood, fan when cooking, things like that. You know, in terms of consumer products, think about your, your choices. And, you know, one of the most important things is to get feedback. You know, I remember very clearly in the early stage, we were testing some messages in Spanish. We were in a, the basement of a, a church in a, in a local community. And uh, these messages were on asthma. And we realized that a, a, a bunch of the participants from the illustrations we were showing thought that those illustrations of dust mites were life-size, meaning they were the size of a dog, right? And we needed to correct our messaging so that it was understandable to people. And then, well, what do you do about it? So that, that's just one example that I was going to come up with. But, you know, one of the limitations here is resources, right? Because all, all the, the testing and collecting feedback um, takes resources. So something to keep in mind there. Do any of our other panelists want to comment on how you make messages actionable? Yeah, I can add something to that conversation. And and again, one of the the our biggest strategies is we try to link to a passion point or or something else that that is of um, importance to the to the the audience that we're trying to reach to. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna I'm gonna give an example that was around indoor air quality, and that was a campaign we did several years ago that was around pets. And so even though kids didn't necessarily think about um, the, the negative impacts that, that consuming tobacco might have on them, when you put it into the context of the negative impacts that it would have on their pets, it made, it became a very actionable item. They're like, you know, the, the indoor air quality, the third hand exposure um, quality of, of tobacco products in your home, could cause your pets to, to have adverse health outcomes. And it was one of our most viral campaigns um, and made, made real differences in actually changing youth and young adults' behaviors around engaging in both combustible use and vaping um, behavior. So again, tying it to that, to something that they care about, right? This, that maybe, because even a topic like tobacco control and even indoor air quality, may be a low interest topic to the general public, but trying to pair it with something that they do, that they do have high interest in. Our current campaign is around mental health, right? Which is not indoor air quality, but again, trying to find that passion point that, um, that your target audience is interested in. Um, Linda, can, Laurel. Yeah, can I just add to you um, really great comments, how kind of bigger picture beyond um, getting the community to act. Um, an example could be, what is our messaging to get, say, insurance companies or larger healthcare institutions to act? For example, um, going back to, to the first question and kind of merging it here, um, if we use asthma as an example, and so we have a lot of data that supports um, the disparities that exist with, with asthma in children. Um, we heard some great data that shows the disparities among um, hairdressers. Um, and I'm sure if we look further, we'll, we'll, we'll find others within sort of like this smaller business and occupational exposures. How do we use some of this data and target and, and better communicate with, with insurance folks to further influence and mitigate healthcare costs, right? So um, the general prescription perhaps for, for asthma patients is the inhaler, as um, we heard earlier, could perhaps understanding better the source of irritant um, whether outdoor exposure, um, what's happening inside, et cetera, um, 
could part of that cost be some of the recommendations that we've heard today around an indoor air filter, right? Because a lot of communities adding that cost, right? is an additional burden. So even messaging around indoor air quality using data that already exists, understanding who the target is and the action and outcome and, and better tying to overall burden on systems and communities, I think is one approach um, that can further facilitate the overall well-being of what we're actually trying to get to. Thank you. I think um, Jill has a response. I thank you. I love your comment about engaging um, the payer into uh, the solution, especially for individuals with asthma. So you're kind of singing my love language there. Um, and I do want to indicate that there are some payers across the United States that have, um, I want to recognize them and thank them that they have been engaging in those solutions um, to identify those environmental causes and then uh, pay for those remediations. So first we have to make sure we have the science behind those remediations. Um, Dr. Vito mentioned about the guidance for vacuum cleaners and it's inconclusive. We need conclusive evidence that shows um, that certain types of vacuum cleaners are going to reduce those allergen loads and then therefore have an impact to health. We certainly do have the NA, um NHLBI guidelines that recommend uh, recommend different types of environmental remediations to reduce allergens for individuals with asthma. And so we do have um, some payers that are taking that step, um, but the devil's in the details, right? And we do have some evidence on what uh, which remediations work, but we need additional evidence. We also need a coding system within the health system, within healthcare. So then um, a provider can appropriately and legally document for those remediations and have a process for reimbursement. And so I think we're starting to get there, but there's a lot of pieces in that puzzle that are in the works and not there yet. So next year we can talk more about that. So we have a fabulous question or a very thought provoking one um, that's come in from the web. And you know, I've heard talk this morning about it with some of the chemistry of indoor air, the talk about VOCs, the talk about PM, the talk about, um, we did hear about some lead. Um, some, nobody's talked about CO2. And I have to mention that as the CO2 levels go up indoors, your ability to concentrate goes down, um, which has been documented. And we know that many cities are now encouraging the development of tiny homes. And by that, I mean like 400 square foot kind of homes. And do we know anything? Does anyone know anything about if they are even being monitored to see whether they have fresh air um, and similarly, we do have some of our, we have many people who live in their cars or their vans. And what do we know about that? These, I should say these kinds of locations for indoor air. Oral? So I'm not, um, definitely not up to speed on tiny homes and, and uh, you know, specifically the question you ask. However, um, if I may bring the conversation back to, again, where people live, um, having access to, to, to fresh air and opening the windows is not an option for, for a lot of people. Um, and so that begs the question around what are some of the additional mitigation strategies um, that can better support folks um, without that option. Um, we're talking about folks perhaps living in high rises in urban centers, um, others who might be living in apartments um, and aren't able to open windows. A significant portion of the population within the vulnerable groups are renters. 
Um, and so what is that engagement with property developers, uh, landlords, et cetera, in helping them understand the value of, of those within, within their liability risks, whatever those are? Um, but that's a very important question. Um, CO2 is a very, very interesting, um, you know, point of discussion with a recent leak happening in, in Louisiana, um, lots and lots of conversations around, around carbon dioxide. And, um, so, you know, I'm sorry, I don't have more, but that's a, a very good question that was raised and an opportunity to learn a little bit more on the topic. You know, it occurs to me that um, maybe we have a policy issue here. Um, I'm not an expert in tiny homes, vans, campers, or recreation vehicles, um, except personal use. Um, and they're poorly insulated, right? And so my my uneducated guess would be that the car that there's because they're poorly insulated, there's probably decent airflow. But if they have a generator or a motor, I would equally be concerned about carbon monoxide in the vans, RVs, campers that people are either choosing to live in or needing to live in uh, due to being unhoused. And so one policy question I would have is, have we considered moving towards a standard to have a carbon monoxide and or carbon dioxide detectors in some of those types of vehicles? Um, moving forward. I have to say, Jill, that was a great um, suggestion because it's something actionable. Um, but I do want to mention that certainly in cars and vans, indoor air quality is quite poor. There are all kinds of chemicals that are used, you know, in your, in your um, car seats, your fabric and everything that all is off gassing and we're inhaling and we know that that can impact us. So there are some many different kinds of compounds we're not even talking about, but I love that. That I mean, you know, many of us, not everyone, unfortunately, and I think that's, again, we need to remember the difference in different communities, but um, many people now do have CO2 and CO monitors in their homes, and how difficult would that be to have that kind of thing in uh, movable homes, or very small homes. I, I don't really know the answer to that. Um, but I think that's an interesting idea. Uh, another question we've got from the web that I think is worth bringing up, and I'm not sure, um, Vito is not actually on the panel, but we could make him stand at a mic and address a question. And between Vito and Laura, who is now uh, retired from EPA, when do we get an Indoor Air Quality Act? <laughs> okay, Laura Vita has turned it over to you. All right, thank you, Vita. Well, I must say I do believe that that EPA's um, current indoor air quality program, which is voluntary, is very effective given the resources that they have. But I think it would be not necessarily critical to legislate indoor air quality in people's homes, although one might consider that in schools and other buildings. It's to put more resources to this huge public health issue, which is under-resourced just amazingly. If you think about the risks that we spend tons of money on, right, and they're, they pale in comparison to some of our indoor air quality exposures. So, you know, part of this is awareness, right? And a certain feeling of security and safety in your, your home or residence and, you know, not, not realizing the risks, but I, I think we're, we're getting there. So, and I think anything that could really move that forward like an Indoor Air Quality Act could really be helpful. Um. Paul is heading to the mic. Uh, thank you, Linda, for allowing me to be make a comment. Um, uh, legislative authority is very important. The Clean Clean Air Act really changed our outdoor air, and um, there are articles saying how many lives have been saved and so on. And if we have good outdoor air, you're 
indoor air would be good. I'm at the Center for uh, Health Security at Johns Hopkins, and we are we work on indoor air policy. And so we explored, you know, can is there a way to have a you know a clean indoor air act? And what we uh, determined was the uh, best way forward was to develop a model clean indoor act for states, so that to provide states with legislative language that they could choose to adopt. You know, who is in charge of indoor air quality? Um, are you going to measure, you know, and so we called for uh, a number of different things about measuring it, posting the data, um, voluntary um, steps that building owners could take. Uh, if if there's a problem, um, then there, there would also be some other, um, uh, both carrots and sticks. Anyway, so it's a very important topic uh, and it's it's just hard to work on. So we've chosen states. I could make a comment about um, leaving everything up to the states, um, but, but I, I won't. But you know, I think the question really is, I totally agree with you that the Clean Air Act of 1970 and the Clean Air Act amendments of 1990 have had a huge impact. So we all know that our outdoor air isn't as clean as we'd like it to be, but it sure is of a heck of a lot better than it used to be. Um, and that's, and, and I really do attribute that to the regulations and we really have, I'm not sure why we would say that the states should do it independently. I think there could be ways that there could, all right, I'm not a litigate litigation person, actually not litigation, um, a legislation person, but I mean, I think there are things, for example, and maybe this is states. Many states do require that new homes have certain kind of monitors. Are there other kind of monitors? There are things where we could begin to have legislation which would require levels of certain chemical classes of chemicals. Can't do it on a chemical by chemical basis. It would have to be on a class basis so that PM indoors must be below this. Um, you know, I think the radon is the one thing that EPA actually regulates in indoor air. And I guess I wonder why radon is the only thing when there are certainly other common kinds of in indoor air exposures that might also be regulated. Laura or Vito, I mean, got <laughs> Hi, this is Laura. So. EPA doesn't regulate radon. The, the action level for radon is voluntary. Some um, local governments require radon, radon testing, for example, during a real estate transaction. And, you know, in local areas are free to, you know, legislate that any way they want to. But no, EPA does not um, regulate um, radon. Thank you. I'm happy to be educated. That was great. Okay, I have some more questions I'd like us to possibly address. Um, so, you know, we've talked about, for example, well, we've talked about legislation, we've talked about the community in a very general sense, but who else should be involved? I mean, should air cleaner manufacturers, um, vacuum cleaner manufacturers, um, personnel who set standards for consumer products. Um, how should they be involved in curating and disseminating messages? You know, again, I'm gonna come back to the need to have clear and actionable communication, uh, which is targeted to the communities and in large part, or involves development of the messaging by the communities. Laurel. <laughs> um, those folks you mentioned, uh, definitely, right? Um, Dr. Vito talked about the challenge of engaging, um, communicating, and then translating um, some of the science to uh, HVAC workers and others, um, thinking critically about where in that process that engagement happens, I think is important. Um, and so certainly I think those folks, yes, um, the education entities, perhaps that train, 
um, some of these specialized businesses might also be uh, a space where um, the, the information then becomes part of the, the culture of education within those institutions. Um, you know, the, the cosmet cosmetology education institutions and others, um, where is their opportunity to, to engage, to engage there? Um, I don't know if it's regulatory folks or, um, I think this is a question about, or perspective. I like to say it's, it's fixing the plane while we're flying it. Um, and so while we need to address the issues um, and make labels and declaration of ingredients and things like that uh, more commonplace, how do we engage the folks who put the labels on um, in a way that it's clearer? So in, in a lot of cleaning supplies, right? On the back, it says... <laughs> For example, for your bathroom cleaners, or say use in an appropriately ventilated area. I'm just like, where, which bathroom is that, right? Like, <laughs> what, what are we calling ventilated, right? Is does it have a fan, and is that ventilated? Like, what does that really mean in context of using this product? Those types of things, those types of labels. Um, we're having a, a conversation coming up in June in Atlanta, the Green Chemistry and Engineering Conference, again, about communicating green, right? Like, what does that mean um, in terms of buying products, right? Is it the process that's green or is it ultimately the product that you have in your hand that's green? And what does green mean? And so I think engaging um, folks, the Green Building Council, Green Building Alliance, the... Um, um, future living institutes, all of those folks, I think, need to be part of the conversation. And, and the last group I'll talk about is contractors. And that's another um, space of occupational exposure um, indoors, um, even though the buildings are not yet completed, <laughs> um, around drywalls, um, the painting, um, the particulate matter, there was a recent article with the folks working on natural stone, um, an increase in um, lung uh, diseases associated with the grinding, the cutting, the installation and polishing and all of those things around um, granite and, and, and other stones. So I think all of those folks um, could be part of this conversation. It's just a matter of where in the process um, and and what it is we're communicating um, with with consideration for the actual outcome. What is that intended outcome for that engagement? So I have another. Well, we do. Laura seems to want to make a comment. Laura, just a, a quick thought came into my head. So think about who has the potential to be impacted by indoor chemistry and indoor air quality, it's basically everybody. Even if you never go inside, indoor environments are now contaminating outdoor air with all the, the chemicals that are passing to the outside. So it's really, everyone has a role in this, but there's some people who have a role where changes can be institutionalized or more permanent, right? Professional organizations like ASHRAE who help us figure out how to run buildings or people who build buildings, right? And, and make choices about selection of products to go into buildings or who do cleaning. There's all sorts of folks who have sort of a, a larger role than, than, than one might think initially in terms of indoor chemistry, all those things. So I'm just saying, there are a lot of people I could just reel off a hundred groups, but you, you see where I'm going with that. Thank you, Laura. I, I just want to, to come back again to communication and messaging. And I'm wondering um, if any of you have comments on the role of social media here. We know that that is a major determinant, especially for younger folks uh, about what to do or what to say or what to understand. And I'm wondering if anybody wants to comment on that whole issue. And that basically comes from our um, online folks. Yeah, so I, so I can comment on social media. It is the primary mechanism that we use to reach youth and young adults. 
Um, the goal is to go where they are, and that's where they are. They're on TikTok, they're on Snapchat, they're on Instagram. And so to get those messages out there, we do it through kind of multiple ways. We have a regular paid ad, right, that, that we'll have out, that will have kind of key knowledge and information associated with it. But another like piece of that is actually partnering with influencers that, that your audiences are already following. So, so looking at influencers, so like in, on TikTok, the get ready with me, if you guys haven't seen them, these are people that are literally putting makeup on while they are talking to you on the videos. They have millions of followers, right? And so we've partnered with, with um, influencers kind of in the get ready with me um, areas who, who have maybe ha struggled with tobacco use or vaping or other topics and had them say, hey, this, this, was what, this, this is what happened with me, but they're reaching this audience that's already there, will then boost their content, right? So that it gets um, even more um, reach within, within, the world, within the world of social media. Um, and then we also partner with experts. And we find that having an expert in, that's in that social media space that has a social media presence um, is a really great way to get information out. So we had a whole piece of content recently around erectile dysfunction and, and nicotine use. And we were able to bring in doctors that, that were in that space and to already talking about it there and, and again, lift them up and having kind of that blend of an ad, real people that are, that are influencers and then experts all talking in the social media space is a very effective way of getting that information out. Um, it's, it's really clear that, that we need to be providing information to youth, young adults and adults from multiple sources. They don't want to hear it from just one source. They don't necessarily want to hear it just from a government agency. They want to be hearing it from real people um, as well. And so trying to get that information out through multiple sources, as well as have some place like a website or, or a source like, like the EPA's website where they can go or the NASA report where they can say, I want to know more information, the more detailed information um, to get that in, to get that content. Um, thank you. I agree with everything you say. And I'm also thinking about how the the vast amount of misinformation and noise on the social media. And we need to make sure that our public health messages come from trusted champions. And so then we provide cutting edge information, um, evidence-based information in a timely fashion. And so our constituents can trust us and continually come back. Um, I'm thinking about a Facebook page, so that dates me right there, um, about growing up in the 60s and 70s, and it's all the pictures of kids riding bikes without helmets, playing in the back seat without seat belts, playing on the playground to see how high your swing can go, and um, and not using car seats and the like. And you know, it's consistent of, well, I survived that and I can survive more, right? So a um, little tongue in cheek there. But I think one of the things we had to do around the indoor air environment is remind people that, yes, we survived the 60s and the 70s without seatbelts, without bike helmets and on rickety playground equipment, but the world has changed. Um, our indoor environments are tighter and so what comes indoors stays indoors. And we have a plethora more of chemicals than we did in the 60s and 70s. So the world 50 years ago, 60 years ago is not the same world we're in now. And so we just need to um, continue to describe that in a way that's engaging and not off-putting and uh, make sure it's coming from those trusted champions. So people um, have accurate information, not misinformation. I'm going to have to bring in the science and challenge you a little bit, okay. which is we do know that what's indoors doesn't stay indoors. We know that about half of the level of VOCs in, in outdoor air come from indoors. Thanks for correcting me. I appreciate <laughs> that. Well, I think that we need to understand it that. It goes both directions. Right. Okay. Thank you. And I, I just, Leslie, and I don't know if you're willing to answer a question, but for example, when we, again, we talk about 
the importance of developing messages and communicating them to the people who need to hear them. And I'm wondering, for example, is there social media being used by some of the, say, cosmetology organizations or the hairdresser associations um, that that is alerting them to the issues of concerns with things like Brazilian blowout or um, phthalates or other VOCs? So I will be honest. I I'll be honest. I don't. I'm not into a lot of social media, so that probably dates me as well. Um, but we are exploring it as an avenue to, again, like, you know, translate the results of our findings and to to this population. And sometimes there are, you know, influencers or people out there giving messages, but they're not always accurate in some of their terminology and language that they're using that I would not use. Um, so that's something to be cautious about as well. Yeah, Leslie, I'm going to just weigh in there. When we work with our influencers, their scripts have to like come through us to be what we call substantiated um, so that it meets the science. And there's a lot of back and forth that goes with those influencers and experts um, to say, yeah, that's not what the science says. I think, Linda, you just did a really great job of that. Right? Say, that's not what the science says. This is this is where we're um, comfortable in talking about this topic and kind of where we want the guardrails um, to be on these messages, trying to, to enhance the aggregate, the accurate messaging and um, reduce misinformation. But I want to put on, I think that this is true with, with indoor air quality and some of the things we're talking about here. We are fighting against industries that have a lot of money sometimes behind them that are putting out different messages, right? So, so they're putting out, hey, vaping is a, is a healthier, um, thing to do than, than cigarettes and, and you should be doing this. There's no adverse effects, right? And so trying to make sure that we're putting out the correct information and and trying to counter what say an industry who's working to try to get profits um, can sometimes be a hard um, a hard battle. But, but Beth, you have the ability to work with a certain subset of influencers. That's true. But if anyone's, in my case, looked at my grandchildren's TikTok feeds and stuff, there are lots of people on them who are not, don't have the appropriate information and yet they're influencing. Mm -hmm. But again, this is too big a topic. This is a whole nother National Academy meeting okay. that we want to schedule. <laughs> so I want to thank that. Jill, you had another comment? I did. I wanted to go back to your original uh, question about who else should be involved. And we haven't really talked about healthcare professionals and healthcare providers um, in this conversation. So I did want to bring that up. And I think that um, healthcare providers, so I'm lump, um, using the term generally for physicians, physician assistants, or nurse practitioners, I think that they do have a role in indoor air quality and chemicals in our indoor environment. The American Lung Association um, just finished up a survey of, in, of um, healthcare professionals and their beliefs, experiences, and practices with their patients around indoor air quality. Our survey ran from December 5th, 2023, and we closed our online survey February 5th, 2024. And we had 1,200 and some odd people, um, providers complete the survey, of which 910 are currently seeing patients or seeing patients within the last 12 months. And just two pieces of data, um, and then I'll leave you hanging on the results of this, is what we found is um, less than one in three providers believed that indoor air quality was impacting their patient's health. So one in three felt it was strongly or very strongly impacting their patient's health. And then equally important is less than a third of those survey respondents indicated they were satis satisfied or very satisfied with their knowledge. And they provided us with a wealth of um, action items of how they would like to, in how and in what topics they would like to increase their knowledge around. So we at the American Lung Association are finding finishing up the analysis of this, and we'll be distributing that, um, the findings in a variety of ways. But we also have our work cut out for us over the next two years of an action plan 
so planting the seed that we are going to be putting together an ad hoc advisory group of providers to help us inform that, but we're going to be developing an assessment tool that providers could use around indoor air quality with their patients, including chemicals, and then how do we pilot test that and then um, start seeing that in practice. That's a quick question. Uh, with consideration for the work that you just shared, um, how are you or have you considered um, where these healthcare providers actually practice um, and in terms of the, the the specific chemicals that might be listed in terms of um, expo exposures and, and priority pollutants uh, for one community might not be the it's, it's definitely not the same for for another, especially you know going back to those who live in um, the footprint and on the fence line of, of industries. So I think I have to answer that in two ways. So the question was, did we take into consideration um, the patients they're seeing and where those patients might be exposed? So for the survey, we collected demographic information of the respondents, including um, the state in which they practiced, and then if they were urban suburban or rural practitioners or a combination of those. Um, so we have that and additional demographics. I think the other part of your question is the work we yet to have to do is how do we take that and how do we develop an assessment tool that either is segmented by where a practitioner might be practicing or their um, patient demographics, or we need to make something general enough for general use. And we're not there yet. We're just starting this process. So I'd like to ask our panelists about maybe how can we improve or increase the relationships between our researchers, those, for example, the chemists busy, busy measuring everything that's indoors and in the indoor air, and the practitioners, not only the healthcare practitioners, but the industries, the people who are making equipment, et cetera. How do we increase that interaction? I mean, I know that in general, if you talk to most healthcare practitioners and you mention any kind of environmental concern, um, you know, they know about lead, they know about bad outdoor air. Um, frankly, they don't know about much else. Mm -hmm. So. Everybody's looking at me, so I'll start. Um, I think um, being invited to the table is a place to start, and this is bi-directional. So when the researchers and the chemists and those uh, content experts get together to discuss their groundbreaking research, then um, organizations such as the American Lung Association and others should be at the table because we're in the position to um, take the research into practice. And so we'd like to be at the table. And then in reverse is when we are starting to do things like develop an assessment tool for healthcare professionals or developing our content, we need to make sure we, we have a relationship with and we know who to invite to the table to make sure they're the, um, they have that, we have that expertise as well. And so meetings like today start to facilitate the process, but we need to find additional opportunities, both formal like today, or informal on working relationships as well. Laurel? <laughs> um, so I like the word facilitate. Uh, that's a, a very, very important um, action word. And meetings like these begin to facilitate um, difficult conversations. I think um, it's important as we convene and continue to have discussions that we're also always reflective of the question, who or what is missing in these very important conversations on change um, and driving change. And so researchers, other practitioners, we talk a lot about community. Um, that's of course the focus of this uh, discussion. It's asking where is the community in engaging with researchers and practitioners and what role do they play beyond just being the participants in studies? 
um, how can we be more deliberate in um, engagements like this, particularly when they're free to attend? How do we more deliberately ensure that um, communities have access to this information? Um, and, and to use your term, Jill, is like, who are the trusted voices in those communities that we can deliberately invite into the spaces? The other part of that is we talk of, we've been talking a lot of communication from the science community, um, from the nonprofit and your research type of engagements to the community. What is the path to facilitate what the community can teach us? Um, and how we include that in what we're doing, how do we include that in building and actually framing the RFPs that go out for um, funding, right? That can better define and you can start um, and not leaving it to an academician to, to find out from the community, oh, you know, have this idea for a grant, but really framing the call for proposals, framing the research objectives um, by facilitating an opportunities for us to learn from, from community folks and understand what are some of their priorities? What do they want to learn? What do they want to understand? Um, and how that understanding will actually impact their lives for the better. We've only got a few more minutes left, so I'm gonna I'm gonna come up with one more question um, that I'd like our panelists to talk about. And Beth, I might start off with you for this one, <laughs> um, which is what kind of resources do you think would help with broadly sharing public health messages? In other words, a central website might be one, but what other kind of resources would be helpful? I mean, we did talk about social media a little, mm -hmm. but I think there may be other opportunities. Beth. Yes, yeah, so, so I would say obviously a, a websites that have that have um, the information on them are are key. Social media is key, but I'm gonna I'm gonna twist it a little bit, and this is it's actually the collaboration, and I I, I mentioned it in the comments there. It's, it's making sure, and I think that meetings like this are helping. We're seeing kind of it here, but it's the collaboration of, of, across all of the key stakeholders, um, so that you're we're moving different pieces of of the entire, the entire effort, right? I think I, I started off this morning kind of talking about it too, is that to really affect change, you know, you've know, you got to have public education, you've got to have the, the, the people on the ground, you've got to have the policy stakeholders and other stakeholders at the table, all working together in collaboration and synergy. And, and I, so I do think having more of these types of meetings is a key resource, right? Where we are bringing everybody together so that we can move um, everything forward, and like in and again, but in terms of public education, being in social media, whether you are uh, fifteen or older, being in, being on those platforms is is important um, to get the messages out. Probably need to go lower than fifteen, younger yeah. than fifteen, yeah, to get the messages out. Um, but I'd kind of like to go around the table to to get a response to this from everything. So, Laura? Well, let me just start by saying money in terms of a resource. Again, I believe it's underfunded, but it's just not, not just money for researching and messaging and testing to make sure the messaging is working, but training for pro public health professionals, for people who are doing things that impact IAQ, people are cleaning buildings, um, money to create curriculums for physicians and nurses and other people and the allied health professionals. You know, there's a whole host of things that we could do. It's not just one single thing. And again, and also for a campaign, you know, we had, this is your brain on drugs. We have all sorts of, you know, famous ad campaigns. And you know, a lot of members of the public don't even recognize indoor air quality as an issue. We need publicity and famous people talking about it. Love that idea. Thank you. Laurel? Everything that uh, Laura said. <laughs> um, but definitely, you know, the funding opportunities um, are, are critical and but also how the 
funding is designated and where being deliberate about where where it's spent, how it's spent, I think are are critical. Um, I'll let Jill jump in. Um, it occurs to me is in public health communications, number one is know your audience. And so I think we need to look at who our key audience is for everything. I think about um, my parents who are in their 80s, and I don't think they know what TikTok or Facebook are. And so to we need to think about who the audience is and then how they learn. And we know that different generations want prefer and do access public health messages in different ways. And so if we're trying to reach older adults, we might want to think about traditional media or their healthcare professional. Um, and it's gonna be different depending on the age of your audience, but start with know your audience. Beth? I think, like I said, I think I agree with what everybody has said right now. Like, and, and Jill, you're absolutely right. Know your audience and how to get to them. Um, and resources are key. I think that that is um, really important. So I think, again, in open conversations um, about the needs. Well, thank you. Thank, I really want to thank all the panelists for some wonderful discussion that we had this morning.